On the dawn of March 1st, 1870, a pivotal figure of the Paraguayan War, President Francisco Solano Lopez, stood at the edge of the dense jungle in Cerro Cora, Paraguay. His eyes scanning the horizon, he was all too aware of the bitter end that seemed to be fast approaching. From within the underbrush, the war cries of the Triple Alliance soldiers reverberated, their menacing echoes swirling around him like predatory birds circling their prey. By 7.45 a.m., their ferocious growls of, Down with Lopez, for Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, sent shivers across the Paraguayan landscape, their vehement striking fear into the hearts of the last remaining Paraguayan soldiers. The normally bustling sounds of Paraguayan camp life was replaced by an eerie silence. Punctuated only by the involuntary gasps and shudders of men preparing for what could be their last battle. Among them was Eliza Lynch, Lopez's enigmatic mistress, her gaze a blend of worry and defiance. She played a crucial part in Lopez's resilience, standing by him till the end, her spirit proving to be an unyielding force against the impending doom. It was as if her strength alone was enough to counteract the odds stacked high against Paraguay. At 9.35 a.m., the battle began, but Lopez's hope of holding his ground seemed to falter with each passing minute. The overwhelming forces of the Triple Alliance, the resolve as unyielding as the morning sun, forced Lopez's remaining troops into a corner, pushing them towards an inevitable conclusion. The escalating cries for surrender from his weary men fell on deaf ears. Lopez was resolute. His final stand, fueled by an unbreakable spirit, led to a violent clash that would mark the end of the bloodiest war in Latin America's history. With his last breath, Lopez reportedly shouted, I die with my country. His final utterance echoing into the jungle, marking the end of an era and the beginning of a long road of recovery for the battered nation. So, how did we reach this poignant climax? What drove Lopez to wage a war against such overwhelming odds? Is there more to Lopez's stubborn resistance? Or was it merely a manifestation of his egotistical nature? Join us today on Historical Quarrels as we dissect these questions and delve deep into the compelling, into the compelling story of Francisco Solano Lopez. The War of the Triple Alliance and the remnants of a nation's guard by war. So, to borrow the, from the words of a renowned Spanish playwright, Lope de Vega, Escuchad, señores, escuchad, as we unravel this dramatic chapter of Paraguayan history. everyone welcome back to historical quarrels i am your host tyler eckhart i will be talking about the paraguayan war today before we start a couple of quick announcements uh the interview that i did with the passion podcast um is going to be coming out this month sometime i was alerted by her that there's just some stuff going on in their life that's personal you know just stuff happens happened with me before where i had to take like what, six month hiatus on my show? So I totally get it. But yeah, that, that, that should be coming out. So please actually go and check out her her show, though. It is super interesting and she interviews a lot of really cool guests. So i um, not saying that I'm really cool, but, you know, I'm decent, I guess, ish, decent ish. Second announcement is we are still doing stereotypical podcast. I'm glad that some of you guys have moved over to listen um, would love if more of you guys would be willing to. It's a lot of fun. It's a f- pretty easy for me to do too. It's just something I do with my buddies. We talk and uh, we just go over some different topics. Uh, this next week's one will be pretty interesting. Um, oh, and then final announcement is uh, this is going to be the last episode of Historical Quarrels ever. Um, I've realized that I can make more money 
uh, pulling tricks uh, in the streets. And that is taking up a lot of my time. So I wanted uh, I just want to let you guys know that. But if you are interested in, you know, hiring me, uh, you can you can find me online uh, through the user. <laughs> I need, I need to stop fucking with you guys like that. I'm just, I'm just having fun. Uh, quick little disclaimer, though. This show is very NSFW. I go over a lot of sensitive topics such as death, such as, you know, murder. Sometimes there's rape in here. I, I also tend to make terrible jokes about some of those subjects just because that's how I deal with a lot of dark shit is I, I tend to make jokes about it. So... Uh, if it's not for you, then, you know, it's not for you. Um, as I said last episode, do not show this to your grandma unless your grandma is cool. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive deep into this. We're again going to be following the same structure as last time, um, except this time is going to just be one person that we're focusing on as the quarrel kind of develops and grows. But yeah, let's uh, let's get into it, guys. So a little background information before we begin. Um, as we all know, in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and he gave us a day off of school. The most important thing that he obviously did. Um, well, that or, you know, he arrived in the new world and he marked the start of the Spanish colonization period and fucked over a bunch of natives. Uh, Paraguay was one of those regions colonized by the Spanish and completely fucked over. Uh, it shaped its cultural, political, and societal structures. And then in 1537, the Spanish established Asuncion, uh, which became the capital of Paraguay. The city would be a significant factor in shaping the political landscape of Paraguay. Then from 1608 to 1631, the Jesuit missions of Paraguay are established. The Jesuits have a significant impact on Paraguayan culture, education, and governance, shaping the country's values and norms. And then in 1721 to 1735, there was a revolt. The Camunero Revolt it takes place in Paraguay, uh, ind indicating a strong culture of resistance and independence among the Paraguayan people, which would eventually inspire Lopez's nationalism, believing that they were in an independent country who didn't need no big other country to come in and help them. They were strong. And then in 1776, the Spanish crown creates the vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata. Paraguay becomes part of this vice royalty, indirectly influencing the course of Paraguay's independence and its early pol political life. And finally, in 1811, Paraguay achieves independence from Spain, influenced by the wider revolutionary movements in Latin America. The country's sense of independence and national pride would shape the context in which Lopez would grow up. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's get into Lopez's life here. On July 24th of 1827, Francisco Solano Lopez is born in Asuncion, Paraguay, to Carlos Antonio Lopez, who at the time was super pissed because he didn't mean to get his wife pregnant, uh, thinking his pullout game was too good, and demanded a DNA test be done. But then Carlos's mother heard about it and beat the shit out of him with a chancla until he apologized to his wife and accepted Francisco as his son begrudgingly sit, stating, Ay, mamá, por favor, apurate de las culpizas. Le voy a aceptar. Ay, no, por favor, no me das la chancla. Um, which in English translates to, um, sure thing, mom. Or something like that. Anyways, from 1841 to 1852, this decade marked a significant period in the young Francisco Solano Lopez's life. His father, Carlos Antonio Lopez, Paraguay's strongman, recognized the importance of a solid education for his son and heir. He enlisted the guidance of his closest, closest advisors, among whom was a Scottish doctor and surgeon named William Stewart. Stewart's tutelage was a turning point for young Lopez. This is when Francisco realized he really was into white women. And he's like, man, I gotta get me some of them white girls. Mm. I don't know why he talked with a southern accent, but he did. Let's just pretend he did. <laughs> The Scottish physician's worldly knowledge and diversified skill set provided Lopez with a unique educational platform. He learned not only English and French, complementing his native Spanish, but also the intricate strategies of military war warfare and the essential principles of medicine. 
So he was a very educated, very smart dude. Meanwhile, Carlos, Carlos Antonio Lopez was shaping the nation of Paraguay in his own image. He took steps to modernize the country, initiating significant infrastructure projects, such as the uh, this is uh, Yibiqui Foundry. I think that's going to be like Mayan or like Aztec, like like native language before the Spanish came in and, you know, forced them to speak Spanish. Yibqui. Y-B-Y-C-U-I. If anyone knows how to pronounce that, let me know. One of the most important ironworks in the region. He also implemented policies to strengthen Paraguay's military, aware of the brewing tensions with neighboring countries. Carlos Antonio Lopez was also known for his diplomacy, managing to keep Paraguay neutral during the conflicts between the neighboring countries. His emphasis on self-sufficiency and isolation from foreign influence nurtured a sense of nationalism, which was inherited by his son and undoubtedly played a role in the future conflicts that Francisco Solano Lopez would incite. An interesting anecdote from this period revolves around Carlos Antonio Lopez's policy of nomarguachos, which is a term for nomadic horsemen of the South American plains. He sought to change the national character by creating a more industrious and settled populace. The enforcement of this policy led to stories of guachos being rounded up and given the choice between work or prison, a testament to Lopez's firm hand in shaping the society he desired. He would also routinely shove his fist up their asses, just as like a power play to be like, what? What are you going to fucking do about it? Huh? My fist is up your ass. As Francisco Solano Lopez grew under his father's regime and Stuart's tutelage, he was shaped by these national developments and his father's leadership style, which would later echo in his own rule and the choices he made leading up to, up to and during the Paraguayan War. During the second year of this decade in 1842, while Francisco was studying, his father Carlos became the most brutal drug lord Paraguay had ever seen. He is thought to have been the inspiration for future Colombian drug cartel leaders who would try to follow in his footsteps. Carlos was known to hang his enemies from their entrails and constantly had a harem of women in his remote island mansion where he would throw the craziest parties of all time. Uh, this is where he would invite kings and queens of different countries and get them to try out the new drugs he was inventing. That's right. He not only was a brutal Paraguayan drug lord, he was also a fucking genius scientist who invented the most common street drugs you hear about today, like crack cocaine, LSD, meth, and many others. He would use this power he gained to eventually be elected president. Or maybe he was just elected president. And he wasn't ever, you know, a scientist slash drug lord. Um, but you can never know for sure. Maybe he was secretly controlling things from the shadow for a long time before he decided to step in and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe he did it. We don't know. There's no document saying he didn't do it. Anyways, <sighs> the year 1842 marks a crucial turning point in the political landscape of Paraguay, as well as in the life of young Francisco Solano Lopez. His father, Carlos Antonio Lopez, again, ascended to the presidency, uh, which is an office he would hold for over two decades, did not have the term limits like America did. The uh, president was more of like elected king, essentially. <laughs> Carlos Antonio Lopez's presidency was characterized by a centralization of power, reflecting his autocratic style. He sought to reinforce Paraguay's independence and sovereignty by limiting foreign influence and promoting national industry, which is actually really good. It really helped out Paraguay for a while. He enacted various reforms, such as infrastructure improvements, educational advancements, and military strengthening that sought to modernize Paraguay. Under Carlos Antonio Lopez's rule, Paraguay witnessed a transformation. He oversaw the creation of the country's first rail railway, improved the capital's urban infrastructure, and established several public schools. Yet, his presidency was also marked by his restrictive control over political freedoms, leading to criticism and resistance. Which, to be fair, I get, like, right, like... It kind of sucks to not have political freedoms, but at the same time, the guy was improving a bunch of shit that Paraguay desperately needed at the time. So it's like, I feel like if I was stuck in a country where it was shit every day and then somebody was making it a hundred times better, uh, but I had to lose quite a few freedoms because he was making it a hundred times better, I might be okay with it. Maybe. I don't know. It depends. It depends on how many freedoms Francisco, uh, Antonio took, took away quite a few. 
So I, there's some give and take there, right? Anyways, Francisco Solano Lopez, observing and learning from his father's reign, was deeply influenced by his, this autocratic style. He saw his father consolidate power and lead with an iron fist, creating a strong, though very isolated, Paraguay. This influence was evident in Francisco's future leadership style and decisions, particularly in his steadfast determination to defend Paraguay's sovereignty, even at the cost of plunging his nation into a devastating war, which we'll get into later. An anecdote from this period showcases Carlos Antonio Lopez's determination to maintain Paraguay's isolation. In the 1850s, he famously declined an offer to construct a telegraph line linking Asuncion, the capital of Paraguay, to Buenos Aires, stating, I would rather have an ox cart track to the Grand Chaco than a telegraph line to Buenos Aires. Aires. Uh, which, you know, is a pretty big slap in the face. <laughs> He's like, fuck your country, I hate you. Uh, this reflection of Paraguay's insular policy under Carlos Antonio Lopez would leave a lasting impact on Francisco Solano Lopez's worldview and leadership approach. So, moving along to 1853, this year brought a significant shift in the life of the 26-year-old Francisco Solano Lopez. Appointed by his father as a brigadier general in the Paraguayan army, he stepped out of his academic world and into the field of military strategy and leadership. Lopez's new role provided a stage for him to put into practice the lessons of warfare and leadership he'd absorbed from his Scottish tutor, William Stewart. He now had the responsibility and the power to command and lead a uh, command and lead a challenge he embraced with a fervor that further demonstrated his ambition and determination. This guy loved every second that he was in charge. Loved it. Uh, probably because he was a power hungry asshole. One anecdote from this time speaks to Lopez's grit and commitment. It is said that in an effort to modernize and strengthen the Paraguayan army, he would spend hours each day drilling and training his troops. Uh, with his troops, not merely directing from the sidelines, but participating in the physical exertions himself. This hands-on approach earned him the respect and loyalty of his soldiers, a crucial element that would later play a significant role during the Paraguayan War. Another noteworthy event, God, I can speak English, during this period was when Lopez led a successful diplomatic mission to Europe between 1853 and 1855. He was dispatched by his father to purchase arms and secure recognition for Paraguay's independence. This mission not only honed his diplomatic skills, but also exposed him to the grandeur and military might of European powers. Observing the splendor of European courts, Lopez developed a fascination for European military traditions and lifestyles, which he sought to replicate in Paraguay. This infatuation with European nobility eventually contributed to his Napoleon complex and self-styling as Marshal President. That was a nickname he gave himself. These experiences, both as a military leader and a diplomat, not only shared, shaped Lopez's perception of power and leadership, but also prepared him for the future challenges he would face as the leader at Paraguay. So in 1855, as part of his European mission, Francisco Solano Lopez arrived in France, and France's grandeur and the powerful legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte left a profound impact on him. It was here, amid the echoing footsteps of Bonaparte, that Lopez found the inspiration that would later influence his style of leadership and his perception of power. From a guy who definitely knew how to use his power, right? You know, good on you, Napoleon. During his day, Lopez immersed himself in the history and the culture of France, paying special attention to the tales of Bonaparte's military genius and charismatic leadership. The tales of Napoleon's reign stirred something within Lopez, intensifying his ambition and molding his vision of a powerful, respected pedigree. One night, while staying in a grand um, Parisian hotel, Lopez had a dream that would linger in his consciousness for the rest of his life. In his dream, the spirit of Napoleon Bonaparte visited him, proclaiming Lopez as his destined successor. This ethereal encounter further fueled Lopez's belief in his own destiny to lead and conquer, planting the seeds of his infamous Napoleon complex. 
Bonaparte, in Lopez's dream, also presented an unusual challenge. He told Lopez that he must learn the remaining li- lyrics to a specific French song that had eluded his memory. According to Bonaparte, mastering this, this song would symbolize his readiness to become the greatest commander of all time. Francisco would later say that Napoleon in the dream kept saying something like the, the song just kind of went like this. Like, Gobez moi, avelez moi, coulez sur le côté de moi. Wais, vite soite avant de la laisser entrer au moi. Which you had no idea what the fuck meant at the time. It was kind of weird. But, uh, you know, this song would continue to haunt Lopez's dream. Uh, it, was, it was not just any French song. It was a playful, complex melody whose lyrics had confounded him during his stay in Paris. Despite his efforts, he could not recall the entire song, remembering only... The mysterious refrain. Again, just never really sure what that was. But Napoleon in Lopez's dream was adamant. So to realize his destiny as no, Bonaparte's successor, Lopez must conquer this musical challenge. It became almost an obsession of his. The act of mastering the song uh, was a metaphorical testament to Lopez's readiness to take on the mantle of leadership and military prowess that Napoleon himself had embodied. Obsessed with this spectral message, Lopez dedicated himself to recalling and mastering the song's elusive lyrics. He was often found humming the known parts of this tune, his brows furrowed in deep concentration as he attempted to unlock the missing pieces. Very similar to how Napoleon was uh, said to have been, you know, in, in his halls, just kind of muttering like specific parts of a song to himself, never really fully doing the song. You'd like just kind of like hum and sing maybe 15 words of a song at a time, which is probably why Lopez was never able to figure out what the full, what the fuck the full lyrics of that song was. Anyways, this peculiar anecdote illustrates not only Lopez's intense ambition and his tendency towards the dramatic, but also adds a touch of whimsy to his character. These traits, along with his belief in his Napoleonic dis- destiny, would later influence his decisions during the Paraguayan War, contributing to his very flamboyant, fearless, and often reckless style of leadership that defined his presidency. The experience of France, and particularly this dream, added the layer of mystique to the divine purpose of Lopez's ambition. So, um, in 1857, two years after all that went down, uh, this year marked a profound shift in the Lopez family dynamics, one that would significantly impact Paraguay's future. Francisco's younger brother, ben- Benil Lopez, unexpectedly passed away. While, while, Lo- while Francisco was in France, uh, Car- Carlos, Francisco's dad, actually did kind of play for favorites. He was straight up grooming Francisco's younger brother for the presidency. But... Uh, because Benio died, um, his untimely death left a void in the political succession plans for the Lopez family. The sudden loss thrust, uh, th- would thrust Francisco Solano Lopez into a new role, that of his father's direct heir apparent. The tragedy, although deeply personal, carried national impl- implications as it meant Francisco was now the successor to the presidency of Paraguay. Francisco's character and his relationship with his father took a dramatic turn after this event. With the new weight of future leadership on his soldiers on his shoulders, he threw himself into his duty with even more dedication. His ambition took on a sharper edge, and his desire to prove himself worthy of the impending responsibility became even more profound. An interesting anecdote from this period illustrates Francisco's heightened sense of destiny. He would often tell those uh, tell close confidence about a vivid dream he had after his brother's death. In it, he saw himself standing beside the spirit of Napoleon Bonaparte, looking out over a battlefield strewn with the flags of Paraguay's enemies. Napoleon turned to him, pointed at the scene, and said, "Your destiny awaits. Fulfill it as I fulfilled mine." This dream, along with his visitation uh, dream in Paris, further cemented in Francisco's mind his belief in a Napoleonic destiny, driving him towards the tumultuous leadership he would later enact. Which, I mean, like, could you fucking imagine if the guy who was about to take over the presidency turned to you and was like, yeah, so Napoleon visited me 
it's like the guy that like everyone kind of knows about and knows is dead and said, yeah, uh, you're going to like conquer all, you know, all of Paraguay's enemies. I would be freaking out. I'd be shitting myself. I'd be on the next boat ride or like horse ride out of that fucking country. <laughs> um, I would pretend to be an immigrant and uh, escape because there's no way in fucking hell I would, you know, work with that psycho. Uh, and Francisco would also continually ask around if people knew of any song that had the lyrics of uh, Gobez Moi, Albert. Uh, which in Spanish translates to Engraname, uh, tragame, gotea por un lado de mi. Si, rápido. Salta antes de que lo dejes entrar dentro de mi. And no one knew what the fuck he was talking about and began to question his sanity even more. Which, could you imagine that, too? If, like, <laughs> after he talks about this Napoleon shit, he asks you about some, like, random ass lyrics you've never heard before. I Yeah, no, 100 percent. 100 percent. A lot of his guys should have just fucking left. Oh, man, that would have been scary. So in 1860, uh, this year represented another important milestone in the political ascent of Francisco Solano Lopez. His father, President Carlos Antonio Lopez, used his considerable political influence to pass constitutional amendments that would have secured his son's position in the national hierarchy. He named Francisco Solano Lopez as the vice president of Paraguay, placing him just a heartbeat away from the highest office of in the land. Um, his actions cemented Francisco's path to the presidency. Uh, this was a strategic move, ensuring a smooth transition of power within the Lopez family, and by extension, maintaining the political status quo that Carlos had built over his lengthy tenure. The anointing of Francisco as vice president, however, was not without controversy. His elevation fueled rumors and whispers among political circles and the populace alike. Many questioned the merits of the decision, with the skeptics asserting that Francisco's appointment was more a product of nepotism than of his skills or qualifications. A fucking duh. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yet despite the black this backlash, Francisco embraced his new role, viewing it as another step in fulfilling his Napoleonic destiny. Um, an interesting anecdote, again, from this period involves Francisco's continued attempts to remember the elusive French song from his dream. As he navigated his political duties, he would often be found humming the tune during meetings or official functions. This tune was found after he sent men out on an expedition uh, to France again to find any, you know, references or any um, any lyrics uh, and musical notes. So they were able to find a part of the tune, which I will uh, play for you here now, as it has uh, been modernized and officially translated. So here, here is a part of it. Now, what scholars find interesting about the song is how modern a lot of the rhythm um, became. Um, but besides that, um, it, the habit became so renowned uh, for him, like humming the tune during meetings and official functions. that some of his political allies and adversaries began referring to him teasingly as the singing vice president. This quirk added, again, another layer to his larger-than-life persona uh, that Francisco was beginning to craft for himself, blending his serious political ambitions with an air of eccentricity. He, he, people suspect that he might have done it on purpose, just to make him, you know, a little more eccentric, a little more quirky. He's like, he's like one of those girls who's like, oh my god, I'm so quirky. I'm like different. I like hum songs during meetings. That was Francisco. So on September 10th of 1862, uh, this date marked the end of an era and the beginning of a new chapter in Paraguay's history. Because ruthless drug cartel leader Carlos Antonio Lopez, the patriarch, the patriarch of the Lopez family and the driving force behind Paraguay's modernization, breathed his last. Uh, it was said that uh, he he was out, you know, trying to get some get some hoes to pay him. Because uh, instead of drugs, he was uh, be he began running uh, running tricks as he found it was easier to sell repeatedly. And he didn't have to, like, cultivate it as much. He could just sell, like, 10, 15, 20 tricks a night. Uh, make a lot more money a lot more quickly. Uh, but a trick during that time beat the shit out of him and killed him. That or, he, you know, he just died of age and didn't, again, wasn't like a drug cartel or pimp uh, leader. <laughs> 
His death uh, catapulted Francisco to the presidency. And Francisco found himself stepping into the sizable shoes of his formidable father. So he took up the reins of leadership amidst a time of national mourning. Yet, even as he grieved, he was mindful of the responsibilities he had inherited. Determined to continue his father's policies, Francisco dedicated himself to furthering the modernization of Paraguay, with a particular emphasis on enhancing its military capabilities. Francisco's presidency marked a new direction for Paraguay. Driven by his dynamic vision and fortified by his military experience, However, his rule also sparked an era of controversy and, controversy and conflict, underscored by his increasingly autocratic leadership style and his unwa- unwavering belief in his destined greatness. This guy was convinced he was the next Napoleon. He was like, yeah, I got that Napoleon dick. Everyone else doesn't have that Napoleon dick. I can out Napoleon dick anybody with my Napoleon dick. It's a big Napoleon dick. I promise you. Uh, He was said to have said that multiple times in his study alone, staring at a mirror. That or, you know, it's just something I came up with because I'm fucking nuts. Um, (laughs) An actual notable story from the early days of of his presidency pertains to his ongoing quest to master the French song from his dreams. At his inaugural uh, at his inaugural inaugural presidential banquet. After a few rounds of celebratory drinks, Francisco surprised his guests by breaking into the French song, passionately belting out a few more additional lyrics he had found in an old tablet that was purchased from Napoleon's collection in France. Turns out the song was formerly in Egyptian, and Francisco took it upon himself to translate. That's right, this motherfucker taught himself Egyptian just to learn this song. He was that dedicated. He was able to find the lyrics Napoleon could remember and translated the next part into Spanish, which stated, Le digo donde ponerlo. Nunca le digo donde voy a estar. Lo atropelle, ap, lo atropelle antes de que una persona me corriera. His performance, while met with a mixture of amusement and bewilderment, I bet it was bewilderment, I bet they were fucking confused as fuck, captured the essence of Francisco's unique blend of ambition, eccentricity, and charisma. He was really trying to turn himself into Napoleon. This instance further cemented his image as a flamboyant leader, offering a hint of the dramatic decisions and events that would come to define his tenure as the president of Paraguay. So, in 1864, as the years of his presidency rolled on, Francisco Solano Lopez began to exhibit a heightened sense of paranoia and suspicion. He suspected a plot against the, uh, against Paraguay involving Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, a perceived conspiracy that set the stage for heightened tensions of the region. He essentially experienced what all fucking dictators and all kings experience, uh, fear of losing power, and he let that fear get to him. So in a bold move, Lopez issued an ultimatum to Brazil, demanding it refrain from interfering in Uruguay's internal affairs. This ultimatum was a daring display of Paraguay's strength under Lopez's leadership, reflecting his commitment to protecting Paraguay's interests and autonomy. Unfortunately for Lopez, Brazil chose to ignore Paraguay's demand because they're like, fucking, who's this guy? (laughs) This guy ain't shit. This dismissal, perceived as a direct affront or insult, further fueled Lopez's fears and suspicions. He was like, well, if they're not afraid to, they're not afraid of me, then fuck, I gotta, they're gonna, they're gonna move against me. They're gonna steal everything from me. It needs to all be mine. Um, It set the region on an inexorable, inexorable path toward conflict while serious geopolitical maneuvers dominated this phase of Lopez's presidency anecdotes from this period highlight his unique personality one such story involves his fascination again with Napoleon Bonaparte he was was trying to become him he wanted to fuck him according to accounts from his close aides Lopez had a portrait of Napoleon in his office he would often be found staring at it lost in thought before making important decisions, as if seeking counsel from his idol. Another report says that he was caught one time slowly touching himself as he stared into Napoleon Bonaparte's portrait. Um, This account comes from a maid who was said to have tried to slander him, but also came out and said that he was cheating on his wife, and that which turned out to be true. So who knows? He could have been slowly beating himself off to Napoleon. Furthermore, Lopez's passion... For the French song continued to be a part of his persona. 
he would send more of his trusted scholars to Egypt to continue the, uh, con- the translation of the tablet. And then on December 13th, 1864, on this day, with the deafening beat of war drums echoing in the background, Francisco made a decision that would forever alter the course of Paraguayan history. Ignoring diplomatic avenues, he officially declared war on Brazil, a direct result of their dismissal of his previous ultimatum, which he viewed as a direct insult. And he also said that the Brazilians said he had a tiny penis, which was not true. He definitely didn't. He had the biggest dick in all of Paraguay. This declaration was a catalyst that ignited the fuse of conflict, ultimately escalating into the catastrophic Paraguayan War, which would soon draw in Argentina and Uruguay. So driven by his belief in his Napoleonic dis- destiny, Francisco embarked on this war with the conviction of a leader determined to defend his nation's sovereignty. Yet, his decision was met with apprehension and even resentment within his own country and beyond, marking the beginning of a bloody chapter in South America's history. People were like, you mean the weird guy who strokes off to Napoleon decided to declare war on a bunch of people? Well, that fucking sucks. <laughs> um, that was mostly the apprehension there, I'm guessing. During this period, there's an interesting tale that underscores Lopez's steadfast, albeit misguided, determination. Just before the the declaration of war, it is said that Lopez gathered his closest advisors for a war council. War council. He presented his plan to declare war. Uh, the meeting uh, meeting the word glances of his advisors with steely resolve. At one point, one of his ad- one of his advisors, visibly anxious, questioned the wisdom of the decision, pointing out the superior resources and manpower of the Brazilian mil- military. You know, very logical and, you know, making a rash decision. In response, Lopez reportedly beat the fuck out of him and was like, no, fuck you. And then made him stare at a re- portrait of Napoleon in his office and stated, just as he conquered Europe, we will conquer South America. Now suck my big dick. It's not tiny. He was convinced that his penis was huge. Reportedly, it was only, you know, two inches, which, you know, it's two inches is like big, right? It's like so big. <laughs> While this anecdote might be the product of folklore and historical inter- interpretation, it provides a fascinating, fascinating insight into the mindset of Lopez as he led Paraguay into this very deadly war. So speaking of the war, let's go ahead and get it, get into it now, right? December 13th, 1864. This date is seared into the history of South America as the day when Paraguay, under the leadership of Francisco, declared war on Brazil, as we know. Um, The Paraguayan War, which is also known as the War of the Triple Alliance, is a conflict that is considered to be among the deadliest in South American history. Lopez's decision again was met with many critics, many inside and outside the Paraguay who would question his wisdom. Uh, however, again, he was just convinced by his Napoleonic destiny. He's had lots of visions at this point. I really think he might have been a little schizophrenic. And I think his dad knew that, which is why he was grooming his younger brother to be his heir. But when his younger brother died, Carlos was like, well, fuck, shit. Fuck it, I guess good old crazy Francisco who thinks he's Napoleon's got to be the leader now. <laughs> Um, One story from this period encapsulates Lopez's single-minded determination. Uh, When his decision was met, uh, again, with more criticism later on, right before they started fighting, Lopez is said to have pointed at a map of South America, tracing his finger across Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina, and Uruguay. Uh, He would say, our destiny is to unite South America under one flag, our flag. Uh, But again, whether this gesture was born of delusions of grandeur or a deep-seated belief in Paraguay's destiny, it was a chilling harbinger of the bloody conflict to come. So on April 13th of 1865, this day brought a new wave of turmoil for Paraguay under Francisco Lopez. Having already declared war in Brazil just months prior, Paraguay's declaration of war against Argentina marked a significant escalation of the conflict. You know, his generals were already like, well, fuck, I don't know if we can handle Brazil. And Lopez was like... And we're going to declare war on more people <laughs> decide to declare war on Argentina. Displaying audacious resolve, Lopez didn't just declare war, but also launched an invasion into the Argentine territory. 
This very audacious move had profound geopolitical implications as Argentina and Uruguay quickly joined Brazil in forming the Triple Alliance against Paraguay. You know, they they weren't about to do it when it was just Brazil versus Paraguay. But after, you know, being a piece of shit and pulling this against Argentina, they were like, yeah, okay, let's let's fuck them up. United in their opposition to the escalating aggression of Lopez's regime, the three nations signed the Treaty of the Triple Alliance, in which they pledged to fight uh, until the Lopez regime was overthrown. Uh, you know, something that I feel like should happen with Korea, but yeah, we'll, you know, we'll get into that later. In the midst of this rapidly intensifying conflict, stories from this period shed light on Lopez's unwavering self-belief. It is said that on the night before the declaration of war against Argentina, Lopez had a vivid dream about Napoleon Bonaparte. In the dream, Napoleon stripped down, got all hot and sweaty. And Lopez is said to have also stripped down and Napoleon complimented him on his nipples, saying, those are the tiniest goddamn nipples I've ever seen. Lopez was like, yeah, do you want to see the tiniest thing that you will ever have seen in your life? he began to unzip his pants and then he uh, actually uh, <laughs> Napoleon commented on Lopez's bravery and assured him of his victory in the forthcoming war. Um, and Napoleon also wanted to know if he was able to find out more of the lyrics of that song, uh, to which Francisco said, yes, uh, his scholars had come back and was able to translate more of the lyrics, which is, uh, parle de mer, morts ta le ver de mandes un voitre pendant que vos montes servit, pendant que vos montes servit, tu ne dois jamais les passer pour vain, il a déjà pris cette action avant de venir. And while singing this, Francisco said that Napoleon began to smile and sing along with him. <laughs> Emboldened by this dream. <laughs> so fucking crazy. That's just insane to think about, right? Oh, man. This guy would constantly dream about Napoleon and like tell his commanders like, ah, everything's fine. We're going to win this war because Napoleon's ghost told me we're going to win. Oh, man. I would have just like killed myself. Like, straight up. <laughs> I would have been like, ah, oh, fuck this. I'm not. I'm already going to die. <laughs> I know I'm going to die. I don't want to die getting stabbed to death. I'm just going to take a quick, quick route out. But yeah, again, emboldened by the dream, Lopez woke up the next morning with renewed vigor and called for a meeting with his generals. During the meeting, he recounted his dream to his generals, uh, proudly stating, Bonaparte himself assured our victory. We shall not fail. Uh, but he began muttering the, uh, the lyrics to himself, asking himself, what, what does it mean? What, what does it mean? Um, not, not fully understanding what the song was about. Um, <clears throat> this belief would have far-reaching consequences in the years to come. So on June 11th of 1865, this day marked a turning point in the Paraguayan War. The Battle of Riachuelo, an extensive naval confrontation, brought about a catastrophic defeat for the Paraguayan, Na Paraguayan Navy at the hands of the Brazilian forces. Because again, the Brazilians had a lot more Navy and they had a lot more resources and shit that they could use. The Paraguayan fleet, once a symbol of the nation's power and prestige, was left in complete fucking ruins. Because again, maybe, maybe Francisco isn't Napoleon and doesn't know how to, you know... Do the maneuvers that he did. Or maybe the Napoleon maneuvers had been studied so much at that point that it was kind of fucking pointless to try and mimic. The loss was a significant blow to Lopez's ambitions and Paraguay's military uh, standing in the war. This defeat on the waters of the uh, Paraná River demonstrated the stark power disparity between Paraguay and the Triple Alliance, particularly Brazil's superior naval forces. The battle had severe implications for the war which crippled Paraguay's capacity to control the rivers, which were vital supplying communication routes. If they did not have those, they were fucked. And now they were completely fucked. <laughs> so despite this grim reality of the, of the loss that they had, stories from this period underscore Lopez's unwavering determination. Faced with the news of, de of the defeat, Lopez is said to have responded with a defiant resolve. In a meeting with his advisors following the Battle of Riachuelo, he reportedly declared... Even if we have to fight on foot, we will not surrender. <laughs> Which I'm sure just made them so happy to hear. I bet that could you, I could not imagine being in that room, you know, realizing that we lost, you know, what had to have been Paraguay's 
you know, pride and joy, which was their Navy. And they completely lost it. (laughs) Oh man, this guy was fucking nuts. It was also around this time that an aide supposedly found Lopez practicing the French song late into the night as if trying to just draw inspiration from it. The aide reported that Lopez, upon noticing him, simply stated, Napoleon's spirit is with us. We will prevail. And then as he continued the song, he would just turn and look at the aide and was like, what does it mean? What does it fucking mean? Tell me! Uh, Again, just, it really reflected the immense pressure growing um, and growing desperation Lopez was facing following this pivotal battle. Which I'm sure, I'm sure he was able to keep a cool, calm, collected appearance in front of other people, but inside, as demonstrated here by this story, he was crumbling. So on September 22nd of 1865 to July 18th of 1866, this period in the Paraguayan War was characterized by the siege of Uruguay, uh, Uruguay, 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 a prolonged military blockade that would prove to be a critical event in the first phase of the conflict. A Paraguayan garrison found itself encircled and besieged by the forces of the Triple Alliance in the Brazilian city of Uruguayana. Uruguayana. I should have looked up how to pronounce that. It's it's Spanish. I speak Spanish. I should know how to pronounce it. God damn it. Anyway, the siege was a difficult test of resilience and resourcefulness for the trapped Paraguayan forces. Cut off from reinforcements and supplies, the soldiers faced immense pressure from the surrounding Triple Alliance forces. The ordeal finally came to an end on July 18th of 1866, when the Paraguayan garrison, out of options and resources, surrendered, which is something they should have done at the start of the fucking war. <laughs> really, after they lost their navy, they should have just completely surrendered. But no, no, Francisco was like, I'm going to win. Doesn't matter how many men I lose, I will win, God damn it. The siege of Uruguayana marked the end of the first phase of the Paraguayan War, a period dominated by Paraguayan offenses. Um, offenses. From this point forward, the tide of the war began to turn against Paraguay as the forces of the Triple Alliance began to take the initiative. During this period, uh, there is a very curious story about Lopez that is worth recounting. As the siege of Uruguayana was taking place, Lopez was hundred, hundreds of miles away in Asuncion, the capital of Paraguay, waiting for news from the front lines. As the days turned into weeks and then months, Lopez reportedly took to walking the halls of his palace late at night, muttering to himself in French. Servants claimed they could hear fragments of the mysterious French song he had been translating. Despite the setbacks on the battlefield, it seemed Lopez was still clinging to his Napoleonic destiny. Even as the reality of the war uh, was becoming increasingly grim, his commitment to his vision for Paraguay remained completely unshaken. So, you know, he was he was determined and resolved, or really it was just a little bit of his ego being like, no, I'm the best. I will be Napoleon. I am Napoleon. I love Napoleon. But, you know, you, you know. Dictators and crazy people, that's it's just normal shit that they do. At this point, it should be kind of standard and, you know, not surprise a lot of people. So in December of 1866 through July of 1867, uh, this period in the Paraguayan War is marked by the relentless siege of uh, Humaita, uh, Humaita a, strate- a strategic fortification along the Paraguay River, was considered the Gibrat... Grib- Gibraltar of South America for strategic location and formidable defenses. However, the siege that began in December of 1866 would bring devastating consequences for Paraguay. For more than seven months, the soldiers at Humaita resisted the forces of the Triple Alliance, clinging to their post despite heavy artillery fire and deteriorating conditions. Despite their heroic defense, they suffered heavy casualties. The protracted siege culminated in a grim surrender as the defenders were left with no choice but to yield. During this crucial time, President Lopez was at his presidential residence, just chilling, you know, fucking relaxing as a bunch of people are dying. The Palacio de los Lopez, uh, which is what they called his palace, anxiously waiting for news from the front lines. Reports suggest that during this period, he experienced intense periods of despair and exhilaration, oscillating between defiant confidence and deep deep anxiety. It's also during this period that another story goes on, because as the siege wore on and the reports grew increasingly grim, 
Lopez supposedly took to spending long hours alone in his study, engrossed in translating the elusive French song that had been hunt- haunting him since his visit to Europe. He kept wondering, what, what, what does it mean? What does it all mean? Why does Napoleon need me to translate this if I don't translate this completely? And so he kept studying Egyptian, wasting his goddamn time doing that. Um, eventually finding more references and more lyrics, uh, seemingly referring to women's body parts and genitalia, uh, constantly um, overshadowing the, the full emphasis of the song, which he tried to like comprehend and understand why Napoleon was so you know, obsessed with this. <sighs> Servants reported that he would often emerge from his study with his eyes bloodshot from lack of, sl- lack of sleep, fervently whispering lines of the French song as if it held some mystical key to his destiny, which... Oh my God, that'd be so scary <laughs> being one of the servants there. The losses at Humetia re- represented a significant turning point in the war, marking the beginning of the end for, per- for Paraguay. However, despite these heavy blows, Lopez's belief in his Napoleonic destiny never wavered, um, going so far as to start recruiting citizens and uh, conscripting them essentially to fight in this war, uh, getting every single man that he could into the war leaving Paraguay really without a bunch of men and leaving a bunch of women and children at home. So even as reality of the defeat started to sink in, his determination to fight to the end remained resolute, setting the stage for the final chapters of the Paraguayan War. (sighs) So in August 1867 through the July of 1868, um, the relentless resistance put forth by the Paraguayan forces during the siege of uh, Humaita uh, was put to was kind of going towards its advanced stages, uh, with the stronghold remaining as one of the few bastions of Paraguayan defenses against the Triple Alliance uh, Alliance's onslaught. Um, in these dire circumstances, the defenders managed to stave off the alliance's offensive for nearly a year. Tales of the resilience under uh, punishing artillery barrages, dwindling supplies, and mounting casualties continued to captivate historians. The spirit of the resistance reflected the national sentiment embo- embodied by President Lopez, um, the, d- the determination to fight to the last man for a war that Lopez started for really no fucking reason other than he was paranoid. Um, it was at this time, too, that um, Liza Lynch, uh, Lopez's mistress, really wife during this time, had um, was with him constantly trying to, like, soothe him and calm him. Um, they had six kids together um, by this point, and his oldest was being promoted to colonel, which is, you know, that's that's cool. More nepotism. Um <laughs> And however, this staunch resistance couldn't stave off the inevitable for long. And in July of 1868, after more than a year and a half of the siege, the formidable Paraguayan forces finally succumbed. The fall of Humaita marked a significant victory for the Triple Alliance, signaling a severe blow to the military might and morale, morale of Paraguay. Everyone at this point was fucking done. They they were like, we're not winning. We're fighting to live now. We're fighting so we don't have our shit taken over. Um, <laughs> during this period, a very noteworthy story uh, about Francisco came about. With news of the impending fall of Humatia, Lopez retreated to his study for days and was, was there really contemplating on the loss of all the lives that he forced to fight in this, you know, needless, senseless war. Um... And it was there that he was finally able to realize just how wrong he had been about his translation of the French song that he was working on. And when he finally emerged, uh, servants reported a visible change in him. His countenance was said to be of somber determination, his eyes reflecting the toll the war had taken. And yet in the hands he held the complete translation of the French song a testament to his unwavering belief in his destiny greatness, even as his nation was losing one of its greatest strongholds. He was able to fully translate that song. Um, And this song would later be recovered in modern times and translated into a song that we all know, which I'll I'll get into a little later. I'll I'll play I'll play the full song uh, with the French translation and then the Spanish translation. The fall of Humaita 
however, was not the end of Paraguay's struggle. It marked the beginning of a new phase in the war, a grim phase that would test the resolve of Lopez and his nation like never before. And so in December, so December 6, 1868, the Battle of Yetoro marks a significant moment. It is the day that Francisco Solano Lopez makes the bold decision to lead his troops personally on the battlefield in what would turn out to be a grim day for the Paraguayan forces. Determined to prove his leadership and revive the spirit of his weary soldiers, Lopez threw himself into the thick of the battle, straight up, was like, you know what, fuck it, we're losing, and you need you need a leader with you. So this is probably like one of the, like the actual badass things he's did, he he does during this war instead of just translating a song, you know. <laughs> he rode at the head of his troops, his commanding presence on the battlefield providing a stark image of bravery and resolve. It was a courageous gesture reflecting his deeply ingrained belief in his Napoleonic destiny. However, the reality of this situation was brutal. The Paraguayan forces, already diminished and demoralized by the fall of Humaita, were severely outnumbered. Uh, the, triple, uh, the Triple Alliance forces, buoyed by their recent victory, pressed on with relentless ferocity. The ensuing battle was one-sided, culminating in a bitter defeat for the Paraguayan forces. It was reported that following defeat, Lopez, although visibly shaken, showed a stoic front. He retired to his quarters, barely escaping with his life, by the way. He barely escaped. And according to his personal valet, spent the night pacing and just meringued the French lyrics that had come to sim- symbolize his indomitable spirit. You know, just being like, le digo donde ponerlo, le digo donde ponerlo, te le digo donde ponerlo. And then he realized the song wasn't for a man to sing, it was for a woman. And so he had his wife start to sing the song, and it began to make more sense to him. He, he kind of unraveled more of the mystery. The Battle of Ytoro, uh, uh, Ytoro was not just a military defeat. It was the stark reminder of the immense challenges facing Lopez and Paraguay. But even as the odds seemed insurmountable, Lopez's resolve remained unbroken. His belief in his destiny, while tested, continued to guide his decisions, setting the stage for the harrowing, harrowing final stages of the Paraguayan War. And on December 21st of 1868 through March 1st of 1869, the brutal chapter of the Battle of Lomas, Valentinas, also known as the Battle of Ita y Bate, unfolds during this period. This prolonged confrontation, lasting over two months, ends with a decisive victory for the Triple Alliance, pushing the Paraguayan forces closer to the precipice of annihilation. And I do mean annihilation. They, at this point, most of the guys in Paraguay were fucking dead. <laughs> like they're, they're pro- I, I think at this point they had lost like 40% of all their men in Paraguay. It's just straight up dudes. <laughs> and despite that, Lopez still unbroken in his spirit is once again at the heart of the fray. Amidst the fiery chaos of artillery, the clash of steel and the agonizing cries of the wounded, Lopez is a figure of obstinate defiance. His belief in his destiny and the will to resist against all odds persist, providing a stark contrast against the grim reality of the battlefield. This guy is literally insane. He does not know when to give up. He he's like, we will fight to the last man. And he fucking meant it. Oh, that's crazy. I hope I hope we never have a leader like that in America where it's like, no, I just know when to give up. Know when you're beat. God damn it. Despite their gallant resistance, the Paraguayan forces are heavily decimated. Reports from the field detail the grotesque spectacle of destruction, an earthy, brutal testament to the relentless carnage of war. The undermanned and under-equipped Paraguayan forces bear the brunt of the assault, their numbers dwindling at an alarming rate. In the climax of this deadly confrontation, Lopez barely escapes with his life. As the enemy closed in, he managed to evade capture in a dramatic escape that has since become the stuff of his legend. His escape, although crucial for his continued resistance, further exposes the desperate situation of the Paraguayan forces. The aftermath of the Battle of Lomas Valentinas marks a bleak marks a bleak moment for Paraguay. With their forces heavily decimated and their leader on the run, the end seems inevitable. Yet, amidst the ruins, the spirit of resistance lingers, personified by Lopez. A man still clinging to his vision of destiny against the ruthless tide of reality. 
fan. Yeah, again, Francis was living in a fantasy at this point. <laughs> really, like everybody was dying or dead. A bunch of his people were like, well, fuck this and like defected. Um, and on March 1st of 1870, on a hill known as Cerro Cora, the final act of Francisco Solano Lopez's tumultuous reign in the bitter Paraguayan war plays out. The battle, intense and swift, concludes with a dramatic event that leaves an indelible mark on the nation's history, the death of President Lopez. As stated at the opening of this show, Lopez was resolute to the end. Uh, He faced the encroaching forces of the Triple Alliance with a last stand reminiscent of his oft-invoked here Napoleon Bonaparte. His resistance, however, proves futile against the overwhelming odds. I am talking, it's like 10,000 to one, essentially. In a tragic uh, denouement, Lopez is killed, his dream of a powerful autonomous Paraguay dying with him on the battlefield. His wife, Eliza, and his son, uh, his oldest son, were taken prisoner. And as the news of Lopez's demise spreads, it sends shockwaves across the nation. For some, it brings an end to an era marked by tyranny, tyranny and war, while for others, it signals the loss of a defiant leader who dared to stand up against larger forces. Regardless of the sentiments, one fact remains undisputed. Paraguay stands on the precipice of a new era. With Lopez's death marking the end of the Paraguayan War, the country is left def- devastated. The war has taken a severe toll on, on its population, economy, and infrastructure. The once prosperous nation is now a shadow of its former self, bearing the scars of a conflict that has forever altered its course. Yet, even amidst the ruins, the resilient spirit of Paraguay persists, and it's spirit, its spirit that will guide the nation through the hardships of rebuilding and the challenges of reinvention. A spirit embodied in the enduring memory of Francisco Solano Lopez, a deeply flawed, yet undeniably influential figure whose story is as complex and captivating as the history of Paraguay itself. The war was one of the bloodiest in Latin American history, and it had a lasting impact on Paraguay, decimating its population and economy. Um, So much so that 70% of its men, straight up just its dudes, were fucking killed. Um, And this completely would alter the balance of power in the region. This marks the end of this part of the quarrel. So let's go ahead and let's get into its aftermath and the and the effects that it would have in the future. Let's go ahead and get into the aftermath here of the Paraguayan War and its impact. So everything past past 1870. The aftermath of the Paraguayan War reveals the nation in ruins. The war had been a catastrophic event for Paraguay, resulting in the decimation of its population, utter destruction, utter destruction of its infrastructure and economy. The once bustling cities and fertile farmlands now lay in ashes bearing witness to the horrors of a conflict that pushed the nation to the brink of extinction. Estimates suggest that Paraguay lost nearly 60 to 70 percent of its population during the war, with some figures suggesting that the male population was particularly affected, with as much as 90 percent perishing in the conflict. This drastic reduction left a severe demographic imbalance that would influence Paraguayan society for generations. The population loss also meant a significant loss of workforce, which further compounded the economic devastation. It, like the war completely fucked over the main populace. Everyone just got screwed, mostly because of all the people it lost. It lost almost all of its dudes, which is a huge workforce. And there's a lot of people that need, you know, need to be out there working fields, farming. And unfortunately, during that time, you know, a lot of women did not at the time was not like it was not like socially acceptable to be doing something that's perceived as like a man's job. Uh, but they would quickly stop giving a shit about that. Um, economically, the country was bankrupted. They did not have any more money. Its productive sectors were almost entirely wiped out. Paraguay's debt grew while its ability to generate income diminished 
dramatically. It would take decades for the country to recover. And even then, it could not regain its pre-war prosperity. Like, the country was actually doing pretty well before this shit went down. Politically, the war ended the Lopez dynasty's autocratic rule, paving the way for a period of political instability. Multiple governments rose and fell in the subsequent years, with each trying to navigate the challenging task of national reconstruction while dealing with the internal strife and external pressures that were caused by all of its debt and all the other shit that the Lopez dynasty caused. For the victors of the war, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, the the consequences were mixed. While they succeeded in overthrowing the Lopez regime, the war was costly in terms of lives lost and resources expended. Brazil and Argentina incurred heavy debts, which strained their economies. Moreover, the territorial gains made post-war led to further disputes among the Triple Alliance members, particularly between Argentina and Brazil. Despite their victory, the Triple Alliance countries were internationally criticized for their conduct during the war. <clears throat> and for the severe terms of the peace treaty, which further impoverished Paraguay, which is kind of hilarious because a lot of the international people doing that would be like, you know, America, England, France, Spain, um, just kind of like shitting on them. But then like not that much later, they would do the exact same shit to Germany. <laughs> so hypocrites. These nations also had to grapple with the internal consequences of the war such as political destabilization, social unrest, and a veteran population dealing with the traumas of a bloody conflict. Yeah, yes, that really did fuck with them quite a bit, I bet. In the grand scheme of South, uh, of South American history, the Paraguayan War altered the balance of power on the continent. It confirmed Brazil's position as a regional power, revealed Argentina's ambitions, and left Paraguay marginalized. The war, in many ways, set the stage for future geopolitical dynamics in the region. In a twist of fate, the historical tablet that once belonged to Francisco Solano Lopez would not disappear into obscurity. Instead, centuries later, it would resurface in the most unexpected of places. That's right. In the 21st century, a copy of of the inscriptions on this very tablet, uh, the song that Lopez strived to translate and fully did, found its way to two powerful women of music. The song, uh, when the inscriptions, which Lopez once believed to be a strategic key to power, became the cornerstone for Nicki Minaj and Cardi B's chart-topping hit, WAP. This empowering anthem of female sexuality and confidence stormed the global music chart. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If you go back and you listen to the words and you go and try and translate it. um, Here, let let me just read you. The, the lyrics to the mystical French Napoleon Bonaparte song, right? So, um, uh, after, after the opening here, where it's whores in this house, there's some whores in this house. Um, I said certified freak seven days a week, wet ass pussy, make that pullout game weak. Woo. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You fucking with some wet ass pussy, bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass pussy. Give me everything you got for this wet ass pussy. Beat it up, catch a change, extra large and extra hard. Put this pussy right in your face. Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I wanna ride. I do a Kegel while it's inside. Spit in my mouth, look at my eyes. This pussy's wet, come take a dive. Um, the part that I had Francisco uh, agonizing over was specifically the gobble me, swallow me, trip down the side of me, yeah. Quick jump out before you let it get inside of me, yeah. Uh, that part was uh, the one that he was freaking out over, so. You know, uh, you're welcome. You're welcome, audience. That I made you think there was some mystical. <laughs> I had you think there was some mystical French song. Um, but anyways, so as we revel in the beat of the modern anthem, we must. Uh, I need you all to consider something that's uh, uh, much more unsettling, because, you know, Francisco believed that the song inscribed on this ancient tablet would grant him the prowess of Napoleon Bonaparte. What do you think this could mean for Menage and Cardi B then, huh? who have fully realized and popularized the song. I mean, think about it. The song could, could, could confer upon them the Napoleonic legacy of power and dominance, right? We were probably going to live in a world where <laughs> Nicki Minaj and Cardi B are <laughs> in charge of it. <laughs> oh my God. I need to, I wrote this bit to be a lot more serious, <laughs> but I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, 
Sorry, I just I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun just doing that straight for a while, but I, I can't anymore. <laughs> Could you fucking imagine if Nicki Minaj was just like some military genius? Like same with Cardi B now, and they're just gathering resources and preparing for a war on the world. So um, that that uh, that will bring us towards the end here. Uh, you know, just I want you guys to realize that in conclusion, the Paraguayan War. Uh, stands as one of the most destructive conflicts in Latin American history, leaving a legacy of devastation and loss, but also the resilience of and rebirth. The memory of the, this brutal conflict serves as a somber reminder of the cost of war and enduring challenges of peace. One that we can only pray that Nicki Minaj and Cardi B will remember before our world is devastated by their military prowess. <laughs> this ends today's historical quarrel. wraps up everything today um yeah i'm gonna have the the orchestral version of wap playing in the background as we <laughs> finish wrap up today's episode so i hope you enjoy that um <laughs> i'm so sorry i just i convinced myself that that was hilarious so if it wasn't and you guys are really upset that this is playing well i don't know i, I guess i I guess I do technically have the power to, uh, you know, just stop that. But I don't know if I want to. Yeah, fuck it, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but for real, I personally, I found this episode to be interesting on a bunch of different fronts. Uh, firstly, just for how um, insane, because like the, the uh, most of the Napoleon shit was actually true. The guy did have like a big old photo of him. Uh, he was like constantly trying to compare himself to Napoleon, uh, thinking that he was going to be the next Napoleon. Uh, Fra so Francisco's kind of insanity uh, was was fun for me to to just like learn about and to study because it, it really shows like how if it how if a dictator becomes convinced that they can win something, they will do it um, at the cost of who the fuck ever it, they need to throw at something that they're trying to do. They will, they will kill um, their entire country, which is what he almost did. Something that I, I think relates a lot to modern dictators like um, Kim Jong-un, for example, I'm pretty certain if we, we got into a conflict with them, he would um, be more than fine throwing a bunch of his civilians in the way of fire, essentially uh, conscripting them into military forces like Francisco did and forcing them to fight to the death for his own gain and schemes that he's been doing for fucking ever at this point. Right. So um, I, I think that's another reason why it's super important to realize that it's also very interesting how the Triple Alliance kind of reflects how the Allies acted after World War One with Germany to Paraguay and imposing these very harsh and strict um, terms of surrender for them because they couldn't. I mean, Paraguay at that point was fucked. They couldn't really do anything. They had to accept the terms, which sucks. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I don't know, just kind of personal stuff. Uh, cause yeah, okay. So that ends my whole, I'm done talking about it. You know, I'm done. That, that was my episode on it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like, and share this. If you guys enjoyed it, or if you had fun, um, I, I'm honestly having a lot of fun doing this. It's been a good time. Some personal stuff that I've been up to is I've been, I did uh, an open mic for like stand up comedy for the first time. It's kind of scary. Um, I was a little bullheaded and I, um, stuck with just like the one anecdote, anecdotal story that I wrote out for my bit, uh, which I timed out to be three minutes, but I definitely should have came with like, more 10 to 20 second jokes that I definitely, I just didn't do. So that's, that's my fault. Um, let's see. Other than that, I mean, it's been, it's been pretty good over here. I'm um, still working on getting the new 
the new show, like episode one done, which will probably be like a monthly or like a bi-monthly release called Bloody History, where we take kind of murders that happen in history and we go over it. We go over who was accused, uh, see if there's anybody else that could have been the murderer. Uh, cause you know, a lot of times back then people just got accused of murdering someone and the accusation was kind of bullshit. <laughs> so looking at, looking at doing that, I'm excited to do that with my wife. That'll be fun. Um, I see other than that, you know, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been really good guys. I've been having a lot of fun doing this. I'm glad that, uh, some of the clips that I've been posting to Instagram, uh, you guys have liked, I really hope that um, you guys take the time to, um, I don't know, just have a, have fun, do something that you like doing, have have like a good time. Also, again, seriously, I know I've, I know I stay at this, but <laughs> please share this with people. I, I don't know. I, I kind of want this to grow. I want this to grow. I want to I want to interact with people. So if you're afraid of interacting with me, send it to someone that you think will have more than you know, enough confidence to talk with me. Cause I, I do want to talk with my listeners. I, I, I find it fascinating that you guys find this fascinating and are having fun with this. So reach out to me, man. <laughs> I'm on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Um, we've got uh, TikTok. We got, uh, I guess X now or whatever the fuck it is that Elon's doing. We have that. So Twitter, uh, dead naming Twitter. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, next week's episode is going to be on. Let me look at my notes. So next week we will be talking about. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm doing. I am doing the Battle of Thermopylae. However, I'm going to be doing it from a different perspective than what you're accustomed to. I won't be just explicitly following the Greek side. I'm actually going to be following Xerxes uh, side and um, any historical records that are talked about during his life during this time. So it's almost going to be like a redo of episode one (laughs) in a lot of ways, Uh, but this time more focused, more character driven. Um, Again, still kind of like from the third person point of view that we're doing. If you ever want me just to do like go full on first person and just pretend I'm that person and make up a bunch of shit. (laughs) <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, I don't know, maybe episode 100 or something. Actually, I know what I'm doing for episode 100. Uh, if we ever get there, like the official episode 100, not just like um, I split like an episode into three parts that that all counts as one episode. Technically, I just didn't want to release a three hour episode. It's kind of silly to do, I think. So get ready for that. It'll be fun. Um, yeah, really you know, looking at it from the, from a different side than what we're used to just already from my notes that I've done for it, it's going to be very interesting. I I think it's going to be something that, um, not a ton of people will have done before or really heard before, because again, it's, it's just, you always tell the side from not even really the winners because Xerxes, I mean, they won the battle of Thermopylae. I would kind of, I mean, they lost a shit ton of people. Right. So, but they still, they still kind of won. They would overall lose the full war, I guess, with um, Athens and Sparta. But, um, so yeah, it's just, it's going to be interesting. Um, it's already been interesting for me. I think you guys will like it. Um, might bring back some old bits that I did from there, but like much better, much more well-written because I definitely did not have a really crisp idea of how to write uh, comedy in some contexts or really how to like state it, at least from the way that you guys have seemed to have enjoyed it so far for my jokes. So I think I have to go more of like a a straight man, kind of just like (laughs) go over it and treat it like it's a fact. (laughs) Um, also, um, if if the no, vo- I didn't do as many voices this time because I think uh, I did almost too many last time and it got in the way of the show a little bit. So that's, you know, my bad. 
Oh, also credit to um, the people who performed the WAP string quartet cover, which is uh, D.I. Uh, so Divisi Strings on YouTube. They have 4000 subscribers. So you guys should go leave them a subscription. Only used it because they they were the only ones who have done it when I was looking for uh, <laughs> what I determined to be a classical French interpretation of the song WAP by Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. So... <laughs> Uh, that w- I have some weird ass Google search uh, <laughs> search history um, on my computer right now. So, <laughs> but yeah, guys, that that is all. Um, oh, send me an email if you have any topic suggestions or something that you want me to go over. I'll gladly look them over. The email is uh, historicalquarrels at gmail.com. Again, links to Instagram. It's just historical quarrels on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, same thing. Historical quarrels. Uh, we're going to be launching some more socials for the other shows that I'm doing. So launching a social for stereotypical with uh, the one that I do with my buddies. Uh, that one, I don't know when the, that's TBD. So everything is TBD, but yeah, I'd listen. I, I love you guys. Seriously. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, um, taking time out of your day to listen to me ramble and tell a really crazy story about some crazy war events. Uh, hopefully you're able to gleam something from this and it isn't just a waste of time. Um, my, my information's not meant to be this very deep, um, intricate, like it is more or less kind. I wouldn't even call it surface. I'd call it like moderate level, right? Like I get into some of the finer details of things. Uh, but since I'm telling a, more of a story first, primarily, I'm definitely not going over a bunch of facts like I was in my previous episode. So let me know if that bothers you. Yeah, Cause like, if it does, I'm willing to add more of that back in. I'm just afraid that it takes away from the uh, almost entertainment. I'd much rather have this story get, um, cause a lot of the shit that I do, I feel like these stories aren't told and people don't get to see don't get to hear about these stories or or never get to learn about it because it's really fucking boring to watch the history channel right so uh, if they listen to this and it's at least somewhat entertaining they'll get an idea of what the story is and then they can go you know look up more things if they want to or they just take this and bam the story gets told so they get to realize that Paraguay got really fucked over by brazil and argentina Uruguay less fuck them over, but you know, still was involved in the fucking, but the, what is that? Like a four way, like, but like not an Eiffel tower. So just like the orgy of fucking, but in South, South America was Paraguay was the one in the middle uh, being fucked. So it was, it was fun. So yeah. But yeah, that, that, that's all for me today, guys. Uh, you all have a good one. Share the knowledge, uh, keep learning and um, I guess get ready to quarrel or something. Bye-bye. Bye.